Okay, welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world. But I don't think tonight's guests need any introduction. If you are anywhere in the plant-based space, we have royalty with us tonight, and they are broadcasting together from Hawaii. If you watch my show regularly, you'll know that Dr. Hawk is a regular as with Dr. Lyle, sometimes together, sometimes separate. And one day there was a cameo appearance by a dashing gentleman who kissed her on the air. Well, the cat was out of the bag and all of you guys said, let's bring them on together. And they agreed. So please welcome Dr. Michael Greger and Dr. Jen Hawk. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. So I'm like, yeah, I, that is so cool. In Hawaii, you guys are so lucky. And we have lots of, we know there's a lot of medical questions, which I'll get to, but they're kind of boring. We, I want to get to the good stuff. And the first question from Leslie is, do you guys have his and her treadmills? <laughs> I well, it's, wish. It's a sad story. There's not even a his treadmill at the moment. I know it's tragic. I don't know how he's like coping on a day-to-day -day basis. Apparently getting something as bulky and, and heavy as a treadmill sent across the Pacific Ocean is a bit of um, a cargo undertaking. So the last we heard it was en route. It's, Someone's rowing it over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's making its way, but you can't airmail that sort of thing. <laughs> So. I'm sure you're getting some kind of exercise, though. You're you're at Hawaii and windsurfing, parasailing. Yeah, nothing nothing too extreme yet, but uh, lots of lots of walking and hiking. We're living up in the hills here above above the water, and it's just beautiful. And taking the doggies out and many many adventures, but yeah, no wind sailing yet. My exercise is fingers typing. Yeah. Wow. I just I mean, this is literally the first time I've interviewed Dr. Gregor where I haven't gotten seasick. So. <laughs> I can always do this, don't worry. <laughs> that is hilarious. Well, Bianca wants to know, who does the cooking? What are your favorite meals? And can you find the same foods in Hawaii? Or are you eating more Hawaiian foods like the Hawaiian sweet potatoes and the poi? Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we both we both cook. We sort of wind up if people, uh, I know a lot of your listeners follow me on Instagram. So I post a lot of um, what we're eating on Instagram and we sort of tend to do we, we, we do the same category of food over and over again with slight variations. So um, we, we fondly refer to the main meal of the day as mush of some type, and it has different flavors according to what we have. We, have a, we get a giant uh, box of a bunch of fresh produce from uh, various farms around here delivered to us every week. And so that changes every week what we get. We get different veggies, different fruits, we go to the farmer's markets, go to the grocery store. Um, but we just put it all together in, in a mush, which involves some green leafies. And, you know, many- You can't day, day call it mush. It just doesn't make it sound good. We need to make it sound enticing. But it's mush. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a delicious, bean and green and vegetable spice melange. Don't listen oh, to it. A her. melange. Okay. Exactly. Not a slurry. <laughs> yeah, no, a slurry. No fecal slurry here. Thank you very much. So we tend to do like breakfast. Um, we've been doing a lot of smoothie bowls. I've gotten him hooked on smoothie bowls. Which oh are my delicious. God. Amazing. Um, with homemade, homemade SOS free granola. Amazing with pumpkin. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. delicious so we've been doing that but then also with the prebiotic mix with the oat groats and oh the yeah and the, sorghum and the lentils we have yeah. lent we're probably the only people who put lentils in our smoothie bowl now um, now see groats that's a word that sounds <laughs> enticing see mush not so much but groats who doesn't want to eat groats just inspires just inspires you so we do that for breakfast and then uh, lunch is the 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 um the exciting cornucopia flavors that Michael's describing. Um, and usually we repurpose that for dinner in some form or another. So that's, that's it's not as adventurous as people might like to imagine, but we, we cover a lot of uh, culinary ground. Do the dozen. Yeah, we, we basically hit the dozen every day. Oh, good, because we actually have a question on that coming up. But they, uh, people want to know what island you're on and how do you get any work done in that beautiful paradise? It's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I, ironically, we came here to uh, all, all three of us. So we're living here together and, and Doug Lyle's also out here with us. Um, so it's like three's company. It is three. <laughs> and he's, he's got his mom with him um, and he's not here at the moment. He's traveling. Otherwise, we'd have all three of us. Um, but all three of us, you know, Doug and I are, are finishing our book together, which we're hoping to finish by the spring. And uh, he is also starting a book project. So the, the sort of the landscape and the idea was that it would really lend itself to creative writing projects that all three of us are engaged in. Um, and has it? 
Um, well, you know, we're figuring out you know, a balance between the parasailing and the writing. It's not a, not a balance that he has any problems striking. He's uh, much more productive than Doug and I are. Wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, we're in Maui for people who are wondering. Well, speaking of, the, of books, there is a question from you from Marnie Jen. Which of Dr. Greger's book is your favorite and why? Oh, oh, interesting dilemma. This is it's, it's, uh, uh, the of, of the books that are available to the general public. Oh, <laughs> interesting. I, I, I do. Oh, it's a tough choice. It's a tough choice. But I would say I, I like I like the hacks and the little tweaks and how not to diet. That was I learned. I learned quite a lot from how not to diet that I was surprised and not prepared to change my mind on some things, especially the chronobiology stuff um, and just some some new data points that I hadn't been exposed to and had to rethink my conventional wisdom on. So it taught me something. So I appreciate books that teach me. Do you guys just always talk science or do you ever have like fun conversations about Netflix? Or I'm, I'm guessing Dr. Greger doesn't even watch television. Fun conversations about science? <laughs> what about science isn't fun? <laughs> Is he this funny all the time? Oh, it's 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 funnier. It's funnier actually. It's, oh. it's, it's ridiculous. Oh my god! And speaking of of looking at each other's content, Mark says, Dr. Gregor, have you listened to all two hundred and thirty six episodes of the Beat Your Genes podcast? And which is your favorite episode? I only listen to the ones that Jen is on. If it's one of those Doug Lyle alone ones, I just skip over that one my favorite ones are the one where dr hawk is there alone <laughs> not being interrupted and can just just straight on in give it the uh, yeah I, the more dr hawk the better as far as i'm concerned very sweet doug doesn't interrupt me too much actually i get accused all the time of interrupting him it's one of the recurring comments i get from people on youtube is that i interrupt doug too much and i'm like have you had have you tried to have a conversation you got it you got to interrupt to get a get a word in edgewise with doug that's part of the that, game that is so interesting well do the boys get along do the boys get along you, the, you and Motown? Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, 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 you and Doug. Yeah, they're 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 living in their own orbits, different different timelines. So yeah, yeah we we're all sort of in our own space. But yeah, everybody's friendly. Obviously, we're all mm. living together. Well, I'm just so glad because for for the longest time, everybody thought you and Doug were an item, and I'm like, no, they're not. Nope, nope. That that is it. That is. But, but it's funny how people just just sing things, right? And just tell stories. It's not true. So here's a question for both of you from Stephanie. She says, in your, both doctors, in your respective fields, is there any new science or any new research studies going on now that you're interested in or excited about? Oh, well, you go ahead. You, you, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm super excited about Dr. Dean Ornish's uh, mm. um, uh, trial on reversing Alzheimer's disease. So for those of you who remember, uh, he started out reversing heart disease when we didn't even know heart disease could be reversed, or at least in the medical literature. Um, so after uh, knocking off killer number one off the list, he moved on to killer number two, cancer, and found that the same plant-based diet and lifestyle program could reverse the progression of prostate cancer. Um, first time any dietary intervention has been shown to do that. All right, wiped off uh, heart disease, uh, strides against cancer. What's next? How about uh, the uh, really going after a hard nut to crack Alzheimer's disease? So basically taking people with Alzheimer's, randomizing them to the same plant-based diet and lifestyle that has been so effective in helping with other chronic diseases like high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes on down the list. Could we reverse the progression of Alzheimer's? We don't know because the trial isn't finished, but it's ongoing right now. And I'm waiting at the edge of my seat. That's amazing. Well, you have said this many times. Is there nothing a plant-based diet cannot do? Let's find out. Yeah. Is there anything you guys disagree on? Oh. Like, I mean, in the I science. think she's the best. <laughs> We're going to have that fight again. <laughs> The substantive arguments about anything evidence-based, I think by definition, because it's evidence-based, we just, or if we have a disagreement, it's like, well, what does the science say? It's, it's sort of like, there is an answer. There's an objective capital T truth to things in that realm. And so if we have a disagreement, that's actually an interesting point of entry to sort of like where, what, who is, who has the more distorted worldview and why, where, what's the location of that disagreement? 
So cool. Well, what here's about, uh, what about studies in social sciences that are really interesting right now? Anything you're waiting to see the results of? I think there's a oh, there's there's a bunch of things. So I, um, as he knows, I'm always reading 17 different things at once. I'm I'm just I'm always I'm sourcing different pieces. It's my openness in the Big Five. So I'm always interested in a lot of things at, at the same time. But I think there's a really um, there's there's a natural experiment happening with personality and COVID right now, which is really interesting um, that I've been writing and talking a lot about just you, how your personality on the big five in behavioral genetics is sort of modulating your, your psychological experience of this moment between COVID and, and everything that's going on politically and how that's going to bear on the election. I think because we, uh, as, as, a, as a political scientist and with my academic roots in that space, it's, um, you don't often get these moments where you have a lot of uh, different, because of the federal system with different states, with different different ideas, um, ha leading to different outcomes that you can trace over time in a really robust, interesting way. So I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting papers in the social science space, including in political science, including in clinical psychology, touching on the intersection between personality and politics in ways that it just hasn't hasn't um, been rooted in that kind of evidence and certainly experimental evidence before. So that's really exciting to me. Wow, you guys are such nerds. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's a brainiac. Uh, what can I say? We're, we're nerds. <laughs> I nice know. To be able to figure it out at the a, a, a pretty brainiac, though. So the big five. Where does Dr. Gregor fall? Is it because I know that at one point you were an astrologer, and you know that I'm an armchair astrologer. I'm very interested in it. When setting people up, I look at that, and I look. I refer to Linda Goodman's book. But do people often become compatible or not compatible based on the big five? And if so, where do oh. where do you guys fall? Oh yeah. Well, I made him take a test before I, you know, before even I, I oh, yeah. before I even FaceTimed with you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I need to know your big five. Like I, I already know your astrology, but that's not enough information. I need to well, know. Yeah, I wish I knew more about the big five when I took the test, because I totally could have gained the system. Like wow. I had no idea. Like, you know, I would I you know, I know what answers would be and I'd like be have like the perfect big five, but instead I took it honestly and you know. Yeah. Well, I'm going to guess he's up. extremely conscientious. That has got to be extremely true. conscientious. Way more conscientious than I am. Way more conscientious right. than I am. Which is, I'm you know, that's, guessing that's, that he's open, but not as open as you. No, I'm way more open. Who is as open as her? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he's, he's pretty open, um, very agreeable. So that's actually important for me in uh, mate selection because I can't. I'm I'm so agreeable myself that if I'm with somebody really disagreeable, I'm likely to be systematically taken advantage of and chiseled in that relationship. So. I need to be with an, uh, someone who's, you know, quite quite agreeable, if not necessarily more agreeable than I am. Um, and then you I'm are guessing he's emotionally stable. Yeah, he's quite he's very stable. We're both very stable in the Big Five, and he's more extroverted than I am. Um, mm -hmm. So he he actually has, which is but but it's it's this is how the Big Five is so interesting because he looks less extroverted because he's so conscientious and so he's in front of the computer working all the time where if he didn't have the conscientiousness he would actually be out and about socializing more than I would be have a natural inclination to do but I'm less conscientious more introverted so we actually wind up at almost the same equilibrium that's pretty good but he is a Scorpio but he's he's so nice I know he's an exception I I don't know what happened when they were making the Scorpios at the factory that day but they <laughs> Because he's not vindictive, he's not, he's not, dis I mean, I'm, no offense if you're a Scorpio, out there, but, uh, but, but he's not like any male Scorpio I ever met. No, well, you know, astrology, I always, I, I, I hold as light entertainment these days, despite a long history wading in those waters. But there, even, even when I was most into astrology, there were always kind of the highest expressions of the energy of a particular sign and the, and the lower expressions. And so I think maybe one day the science will prove that astrology <laughs> is a science. So here we're going to go from astrology to rectal prolapse. What, where else can you go, right? And so yeah, that's a good got like and carrots. Yeah, as good a segue as any. So we do have to, a few questions. This is from, okay. um, well, some people prefer to be anonymous just, you know, based on the nature of their question. So the, the individual says they have rectal prolapse and need surgery to fix it. Should they refuse the intravenous antibiotics they usually use? If not, what's the best way to recover from it? I've been SOS free for 10 years and vegan since 1999. Don't disclose my name. I didn't. But you know, I just interviewed a pelvic floor physical therapist and they do a lot of things for prolapse. 
Well, yeah, for presumably vaginal prolapse. Oh. Um, but uh, uh, yes, take IV antibiotics. Anytime you cut into the body um, in a surgical setting, the reason why we are able to do surgery is because of the uh, miracle drugs that are um, antibiotics. Um, so uh, we don't die of sepsis. We don't die of infection. Um, and so it's part of the package. Um, and so absolutely would do that in terms of recovery after surgery. It's about um, uh, you know, taking it easy and uh, eating uh, and uh, eating healthfully, depending on what uh, kind of diet they actually want to have people on. Okay, thank you. So this is from Tammy, who is a blogger, plant-based food blogger, getting lots of questions about this. Is there anything special when washing our fresh produce during the pandemic we have to do in order not to catch COVID-19 if someone who is COVID positive has touched it? And do you do you guys go into any extraordinary lengths with your produce to wash it or things like that? Just, we're afraid of a, a, a local... Um a local pathogen that's common in, in Hawaii that, so we, we wash our vegetables really, really well to avoid rat lungworm disease, but yeah. Who wants <laughs> rat lungworms in their brain to paralyze them? Not me. And they're found on greens, which is like my holy grail right. food. We so, have a lot uh, of greens around so, here. So uh, yeah, we are we are washing our produce, but only because we don't want to die of parasitic infections and that has nothing to do with COVID. Yeah, right? but the general question about, you know, is there is there anything special that people should be doing? Nope. Yeah. No, I mean, you should wash your fruits and vegetables, period, under Just running generally. water for, for other food safety reasons. Yeah. I mean, who knows what orifice the person was scratching who last touched that 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 produce. Um, but, but uh, yeah, not from a COVID standpoint. Um, early on, we were concerned. We just didn't know what kind of uh, the transmission pathways. Um, but now we know. Um, the primary route of transmission are these respiratory droplets and aerosol spread, not so-called fomite spread or contact spread. Um, so we should, of course, still wash and sanitize our hands after touching public surfaces, before touching our eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, but that does not appear to be the primary method of spread. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Another anonymous. Uh, I've never oh. heard of this. This is... Uh, Dr. Gregor know, does Dr. Gregor know of any way to improve ligament laxity from Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? It is a oh. professional obstacle. I've been whole food plant-based vegan for 20 years. Um, well, unfortunately, it's a genetic condition. That has to, it's a connective tissue disease. And uh, yeah, there's no known kind of dietary intervention. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's kind of pros and cons to the disease, but there's not much you can do in terms of uh, affecting its expression. Mm -hmm. Do you guys get recognized? I don't know how much you go out, but do people recognize you? They recognize him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but yeah, in like, yeah, yeah. Well, in, 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 uh, in vegan yeah, cafes yeah, yeah, in yeah, Maui. In a, yeah. In a, in a yeah. plant-based restaurant. Uh, yeah. Mostly it's often, it's often they hear my voice because, mm -hmm. you know, I have like a mask on, they don't even know, but then they hear my voice. I'm like, you know, ordering the kale salad and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, the, some heads turn. We, we went to a, a really cute little, there's actually a couple, one of the great things about Maui is that it's really plant-based friendly and it's, it's a whole food plant-based friendly. I mean, there's a lot, there could so much beautiful produce is being grown here. And, um, and a lot of these restaurants are using local food. And so we went to one of my favorite places on Maui and uh, he was wearing his broccoli t-shirt. So even with the mask, it's like, you could see the gears turning in the guy's head because he sort of like thought maybe he recognized it. And then it's like, oh, there's a broccoli t-shirt so for sure and, and uh, it was very sweet and i think i think we affected uh i think he ordered something a little healthier at that cafe that day than he might otherwise have ordered i was looking critically over his shoulder the whole time <laughs> what do you want to order <laughs> that's amazing so barb says what i love about you both is you also seem to be ethical vegans do you use only cruelty-free products for skin care and and washing etc and what are some of your favorite brands I, I was actually just telling, I was just complaining about how I was um, at the Sephora in, in Maui trying to get some, some of my usual stuff. And there was a new product with a line that I know is vegan um, and cruelty-free. Uh, and I was asking them if the, the new item was as well. And they had no idea. They had to look it up. So I was, I was just relaying the story with great, because I was just like, how could they not know? And 
And the woman at the store was actually like, well, I don't see the bunny. And I'm like, well, but the whole line is cruelty free. So it's very important to me. It's something that really strongly informs my consumer choices. Um, and it's it has for many years. And um, so I, yeah, I have one foot in both the, the sort of health world and the, the cruelty free, like just trying to make the planet a better place for all sentient beings world. So those, those are things that um, exert equal pressure on my consumer choices for sure. I like Dr. Bronner's. In fact, the peppermint Dr. Bronner's evidently centipedes don't like peppermint. Oh my God. And so we, we, <laughs> we have a bit of a centipede issue here. And I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we have an issue. We have we have seen centipedes around. That's an issue. And That's so, an issue. And so centipedes are one of the only things in Hawaii that actually are like, you, do, you don't want to tangle with a centipede because they do bite and the bite can be, depending on how susceptible you are, just sort of annoying like a bee sting or life-threatening like a bee sting. So it really depends on your physiology and we don't wanna test it and find out. Um, and so we're trying to deter the centipedes without you know, any, any toxic, nasty pesticides or anything. And apparently peppermint oil. So our house now smells a little like Santa Claus's workshop. It's got like a little, little cotton pads of peppermint oil stashed in the corners too. Apparently it also um, is a, an unfriendly scent to cockroaches. So bonus. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, here's an interesting question. Um, so it's from Christine. It says, Dr. Greger recommends the Daily Dozen and also for weight loss 21 tweaks. The thought of me adding 33 daily habits or behaviors to my diet seems overwhelming to me. I feel that if I set the bar that high, I will fail and end up in the ego trap. Are all 33 of these things really necessary? I mean, go ahead and answer it, but we may, we may disagree. <laughs> the, we, I, there's an app for that. Why do you think I made a free app for iPhone, Android, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen? You can click through. It's not about perfection. It's just, it's like a game. You can graph your progress. Oh, I got, I hit half the Daily Dozen today. That's awesome. Tomorrow I'll try to do a little more, whatever. It's just, these are all things that you can um, test out, see what works for you. And I'm very clear about that in my books. I'm like, look, if this doesn't work for you. Then don't do it, right? I mean, as easy as that, um, but just trying to give people every possible option and every possible tip, trick, tweak technique to accelerate the loss of body fat. Um, uh, you know, that's, and, and so uh, go crazy. If you don't like vinegar, don't eat vinegar. If you don't like garlic powder, don't eat garlic powder. Whatever you want to do. Just want to give people all the options. And it is just important to recognize, like she's articulating that she knows it might put her into the ego trap if she sets the bar too high. So knowing yourself and knowing your personality and, and how, um, you know, somebody who's got an app that checks things off, if you do have that highly high conscientious nutcase personality that we talk about sometimes, that can be very difficult for that personality to see unchecked boxes. Mm. And so, so yeah, if it's somebody who's going to be really stressed out by not hitting all of those targets, then um, setting a more reasonable goal is definitely the way to go there. Um, and you're, you, you'll, you'll be okay if you don't, if you don't hit them, especially the, the tweaks, which are really just add-ons, like the, the, they're not substantive. Do the daily half dozen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there should be like a beginner's daily dozen, like the daily one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, did, did you eat something green today? You know? <laughs> That's great. Jane says, is there any mouthwash that is safe to use or do they all kill the bacteria that are needed for nitric oxide production? Not a video on that. I, what she said. Wait, so so Jen, have you watched every single Nutrition Facts of course video? Not. Of course, there are thousands of them. No, I haven't watched all of them. Uh, yeah, and every <laughs> time she asks me a question, there's a video about it, I just kind of roll my eyes. Yeah. And and even the ones I have watched, I, you know, it's, I'm not necessarily going to retain. She doesn't every remember tiny every single detail. What? Why do I even do these videos? If people aren't even going to so remember I'm, them. I'm just ashamed. Well, but yeah. that, that's a good question. How, you, you how do you remember them? I mean, you have thousands. How do you remember all of this? You don't need to remember them because they're online for free at any time, right? That's the whole point. That is he hilarious. Really remember every little detail either. Sometimes he has to go. I, ha I have to go. <laughs> I, someone asked me, I, I was just doing an interview today um, uh, about uh, plant-based diets and sexual function. And I'm like, so I went to Nutrition Facts, typed in sexual, and I'm reading all, I'm reading my transcripts and I'm like spouting it off as if I remembered all this stuff. But I, you know, there's <laughs> thousands of studies. That's amazing. So, 
You know, I, it, oh, here, we, yes. So go to the nutrition bags, write it in a mouthwash. Now, basically, you want to avoid anti um, uh, alcohol containing mouthwashes because the alcohol not only produces a carcinogen um, uh, um, uh, called acetaldehyde, but also wipes out the, the, the good flora on your tongue, which converts um, uh, uh, the nitrates um, you eat uh, to uh, the nitric oxide that's important for um, uh, dilating our arteries, and improving blood flow, Thank which you. would go back to the sexual function thing. Absolutely. Have you guys been to the Costco? Yes, we did. We, we did some recon at the Costco because we were looking to see where to get the most greens for the cheapest and the most available. No and, kale. Yeah. No, no, no kale, kale in the Costco Maui. They should just close their doors in shame. But we did. It's a good source for beans, which we go through a lot of beans and, uh, you know, some grains and some staples that we can't get locally or that are super expensive locally. So um, and it's for gas, too. It's it's uh, it's worth having the membership just to get gas. Um, uh, when she, she's talking about the beans we're getting. Oh, the beans giving you the gas. That's a, that's hilarious. Do they have the, those really dark purple Hawaiian sweet potatoes yeah. at, at all the oh, stores? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, they, those, that's been showing up in our weekly box um, with the, yeah, the, they're, they're grown locally. So they're just amazing. Um, they're like fluorescent. Yeah, but we have to fight Motown for them because he is obsessed. My, my dog Motown is like, fixated yeah he's over here. Here. that's reason enough to move to hawaii because when you get them shipped here they have to do something to them like ir irradiate them or something before they'll ship them and they're quite expensive when when you get them shipped here that that reason is a reason alone to move to hawaii just to get those you are potatoes. welcome to visit anytime we got oh. we got purple potatoes all over the place so yeah but they are delicious they're really yeah. really really good so, so the last time I was at Hawaii was to speak at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, and there there, there seems to be a, a lot of obesity on the island. And then they said that the national food of Hawaii is spam. Are you seeing that people are are still eating a lot of spam? I don't know. I haven't seen spam, but I mean, it's it, it's just the westernization of the you know Pacific Islander um, uh, uh, diet that leads to some of the worst obesity rates in the world, really. Um, and it's sad because we're the ones who gave them the spam, right? We're the ones that, uh, and so if they would have just stuck to their native foods um, and ate their taro and fruits and vegetables, then uh, they would not have the kind of obesity rates that they're suffering from here and around the rest of the country. Yeah. Have you guys had poi? Not yet. There, there's, um, I mean, not, not, not real. I mean, there's, there's little vegan poi at the different vegan cafes that we go to. So we've had, I've had versions of that. Um, but yeah, Top. there's tofu. It, tofu. It's very good. It, to me, it tastes a, little, a lot like pudding. Yeah, I haven't had it on this since we've moved here, but I've, ha I've had the tofu poi at Mocha Roots before and other places. So and what, about, what about taro? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I haven't. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I, I have been making Maui my home for a while. So I sort of have, I was, I was triangulating on this for a while before actually moving here. So yeah, it's like, you know, there's only two, two states other than California that I like Alaska and Hawaii, and you've managed to live in both of them. Alaska. I'm, I'm, I'm a, Why would you want to go to Alaska? Oh, I, I had a great time there. I saw a moose. I, I just loved it. I, I mean, I went in the summer. I don't think I would have liked it in the winter. No, it's definitely, definitely has more charms in the summertime, but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not suited for the mainland. What can I say? You know, it's like, I just, I belong in the freak states. <laughs> That's great. So here's a question and I know you both know the answer, but um, I'll ask it. Amber says, how important is it that we do not use oil? Is there any oil that is less damaging to our health than others? You know what Dr. Goldhammer would say, just because something's less bad doesn't mean it's good. Uh, I'll let you tackle that since you're more um, uh, Well, there's, there's benefits to oil topically. Um, in fact, I have a video coming out talking. Uh, oh, it's gonna freak people out. But it's like the it's, uh, the title is like the benefits of olive oil for oh. some kind of arthritis or something. But it's topical olive oil. There's actually these anti-inflammatory compounds. And if you rub it on your knee versus some carrier oil, um, missing these olive compounds, you get a significant improvement in. I forget what they were measuring. Probably joint pain. Um, so, but uh, yeah, but I just wouldn't uh, chug the stuff. Yeah. How do you decide which topics to to undertake? Uh, whatever comes out in the literature. I, I mean, see. so you know, I'm I'm just uh, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal on the planet. So busy folks like you, 
don't have to. Well, how do you have time to watch shows like Schitt's Creek or any of those good things on Netflix? I've never even heard such a show. <laughs> I'm too busy saving lives. I love your voice. Yeah, I'm so glad that you, I, I always get your books on Audible because just to listen to you is fun and it's even funner in 2.0. You think he's fun in 1.0. You should listen to him at double speed. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Do I sound like That's the true. chipmunk? Yeah, I know. You sound great. Ah, so um, Michael says, what do you recommend to raise a low total cholesterol 105? Why would, why do you have to you raise You would not it? want to raise a, a, your cholesterol. The lower, the better. I have a bunch of videos coming out on that. Unfortunately, I've got to run to another interview. Yes, so thank you so good. much. I understand. Is it, okay if we, is, it well, is it okay if we keep Jen a little bit longer? I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not as, I'm not as in demand. I will <laughs> give you permission to, but, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greger. Let's, let's hear for Dr. Greger. I mean, you can you can leave too, Jen, but the last time you guys were on, look at how much, that's why, that's why I respectfully request to all the live viewers to please send us back uh, your questions when we send out the email saying who's going to be on because it's a lot easier to read here than here because this moves, this doesn't. We, we have questions left over. You want to just do a couple and feel free to stay as long or as short as you like. Sure, I can totally say I'm, I'm, I'm not as suited for answering the specific. No, you, th these are the ones that were left over from when you and Doug appeared. So these are all towards. Yeah. Okay, good. So the first one is from Susan. What advice do you have from us during the moments when the fear of catching the virus rears its ugly head? Most of the time I'm okay, but sometimes the worry and need for unending vigilance gets to be too much. I'm 75 years old, active on a whole food plant-based diet. Mm, yeah, we've talked about this a lot on the, on the podcast, so folks can tune into that. And it's, it's really... Um, it comes, I mean, you are, you're always running a cost benefit analysis. There's always any time that we talk about anything having to do with anxiety or, or really just any human behavior or relationships or stress or anything, you've got to look at what's the cost benefit analysis. And, and a cost benefit analysis is really you're, you're looking at a situation, trying to figure out what the best thing to do as an animal, trying to solve your survival and reproduction problems in the context of that problem. What is the best way to use your pressure? Precious time and energy to solve that problem. So the cost benefit analysis and, and it's um, the ways that it can go hay, haywire. That's how we wind up in something like the pleasure trap. It's really at the heart of the pleasure trap. You're running a cost benefit analysis on what's the, you know, you've got limited time. You've got a limited number of times you can chew something, limited number of calories that you can get in the system per day. Um, so what is the most efficient and effective use of your time and energy? Is it a kale salad or is it a slice of pizza? Um, and so we are always going to be drawn to these things that, that are, are quicker and easier and give us more pleasure and limit our pain. So that's the, the essence of the cost benefit analysis. But the other piece of that is that your personality has everything to do with how you're running a particular cost benefit analysis. So somebody who is more conscientious, like we were talking about before, is going to have a different cost benefit analysis on whether it is a better use of their time and energy to eat the kale salad or the pizza because it's more important to them as a personality to do the right thing, to stay on track, to follow the rules because they're wired to be more conscientious. If you're wired to be a little more self-indulgent, that's going to be a different cost benefit analysis for you. So the cost benefit analysis, or we call it the CB, if you hear us say CB, that's what we're talking about, um, is really, it's the engine of human behavior. And it's also driving your, your moods and your, your, the thoughts that are emerging from your moods. So if you're having a lot of anxiety about COVID, um, it's, it really, it, it, it's a good thing. It's a good practice to get into to really try to um, essentially practice some mindfulness around that for lack of a better word. So I spent years in the, in the Buddhist world doing a lot of meditation um, and, and becoming friends with my mind as my teacher used to call it. And that's really just a process of sitting back and watching how you're running the cost benefit analysis on something and getting into that, that modality with it where you become a little critical of the thoughts that your brain is spewing out. So, you know, you're feeling a lot of anxiety. You sit with that anxiety and, and start to 
ask yourself, is it really valid? Is it really true? Are you really making an inference about the danger that you are in this moment? Or are you just, is your mind sort of spinning stories um, because you've been watching too much news, because you're, you're thinking about it too much, because you're not focusing on other uses of your time, you've lost your hobbies, you've lost your social connections. So all you're doing is you know, refreshing Twitter and watching CNN and scaring yourself. So all of those things give you um, more perspective on where your moods are coming from and, and how to manage them. And it starts with managing your environment, just like you have to manage your environment to stay out of the pleasure trap. If you are prone to a lot of anxiety about current events, whatever those events might be, it limiting your exposure to how relentlessly you're exposing yourself to that information on an ongoing basis is an important strategy for you to defend your bubble and, and to um, defend your mental health, because that's, it's, it, that's the front line of where those thoughts are coming from. Thank you so much. I agree. For me, the biggest saving grace of all this is I, I, I never watched the news before it, so I'm not going to start now. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's hard for people because we are Stone Age creatures, you know, always, always going back to how we tried to solve these problems in the Stone Age. And in the Stone Age, it was a huge mistake to not be up on every little detail of what was going on in the village because you were living in a village of 100 or 200 people. And ignorance was not bliss in that context because anything that was going on politically or if there, if there was a sickness that was spreading through the town or anything that was happening you wanted to know all of the nitty-gritty details about that because it was very likely to directly affect you and you were very likely to be able to have a direct impact on it through your own behavior and that's no longer true so we still have this programming that makes us hyper vigilant about what's going on and we feel this obligation and we feel like we're doing something wrong if we're not up on the news but you've got to re recognize that that's stone age programming that doesn't apply to the modern environment you, you're caring Carrying over something that helped your ad adaptive history and made you more successful in your evolutionary history, but that actually undermines your happiness in the modern environment. So um, developing that awareness is key. That's awesome. You know, which, which fun question I forgot to ask you guys, but maybe you can ask it from Raina was what was, what is your favorite quality of Dr. Gregor? And what, what do you think he would have said if I asked him about you? Oh gosh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure sure what he would say about me. Um, I, I love his just his his general um, resilience, you know, the sort of like as expressed in many, many different ways. So like we it's everything is up for discussion. We can talk about lots of things. We can, um, you know, if we do have a disagreement about something, it's just a, there's this process, this emergent process of discovering the truth together. Um, and I, I love how open he is to that and how, um, how uh, just, just good hearted he is in that, in that process. And of course he's hilarious too, which helps. Yeah, so. he's, he's so funny. I just, <laughs> oh. so, this is from Julie. I'm curious about what actually causes anxiety. I understand that exercise, meditation, breathing, and distraction will dial back the discomfort of this challenge. I would like to dig deeper and get to the root of why I have thought loops that per perseverate even when I know that they are unhelpful. Maybe I'm just asking for the magic pill that will make them stop. Well, I had my session with Dr. Lyle today and he basically said, it's genetic. Yeah, it's genetic. It's your personality. It's it's that conscientiousness almost certainly. So if you're so your mood is again a reflection of your inference about your standing in the village at any given time. So we're we're constantly we have sort of built in anxiety about our well-being and our safety and how included we are and how much people love us or not. All of those things are very human, um, human concerns and we are constantly attuned to them. And all of our moods are, you can essentially think of your mood as a barometer that is telling you how likely you're inferring your, your chances of surviving and reproducing are in that moment. So our mood goes up, all things equal, if things are going well for us. But what, what going well for us means is that our chances of survival and or reproduction have just increased. So we just asked the person that we have a crush on to the school dance and they said, yes, our mood goes up because our, our, per our perception and our inference of how well we are likely to do in the evolutionary derby has 
just improved by some measure. If they say no, our mood declines. And so it's really just this, it's this mechanical process where we are constantly, this is why we call our website Esteem Dynamics, because these things are dynamic. They are informed by the exact, um, uh, the, the degree of those relationships at any given moment in time, which can change on a, on a dime. So, you know, he can say yes today, he can say no tomorrow, you can be, get the job offered today, you can get it taken away tomorrow. Your mood is going to follow those vicissitudes of your circumstances. And it is supposed to, because your, your mood is like a, it's a guidance system to try to get you to change your behavior to improve your survival and reproduction odds. So if you, um, if you, if you're perseverating and you're having like, very anxious thoughts and um, they're around the same kinds of things you you were engaged in a process that you're you're supposed to have anxiety about things that have declined your your stake in the game that's how it's supposed to go but if you've got the kind of personality that exaggerates that 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 really dials it up to 11 and that is usually the the hyper conscientious personality um life is just so much noisier for you you're running the worst case scenario at a level that is um, unusual for the species so we talk all the time in terms of bell curves so a bell curve is just a bell-shaped curve. It's a frequency distribution of any kind of characteristic in the population. Um, and so if we were to measure everybody's height in Maui, it would fall on a bell curve. You'd have most people of average height and you'd have a few very short people and a few very tall people. And those bell curves apply to personality as well. They, they apply to any kind of genetic trait. So a bell curve for conscientiousness, most of the population is of average conscientiousness. They're not that anxious. They're not that worried about things. They're not that dedicated to doing the right thing no matter what. Um, and then you've got a few people at the tail end over here who are absolute flakes. They really, nothing bothers them. Those are the, those are the people that can't you know, pay their rent on time. They don't get insurance for their car and they get pulled over and they're, they're, they get in all kinds of trouble. Um, those are people who just really have no sensitivity and, and they don't worry and they're, they're happy all the time. And then at the other tail end, you've got a few people, not, not very many, who are very anxious, who are very, they're just running a very sensitive worst case scenario meter all the time. And so something that would not bother the average person on the bell curve is going to bother the highly sensitive person a lot. And they're going to perseverate about it. And they're going to they're going to be inferring that there's this big cost to their survival and or reproduction. But that goes back to what I was just talking about with managing your your thoughts and feelings around something like COVID is these practices that you're talking about mindfulness, meditation, distraction, um, all of those things, those really are the only tools aside from psych meds that we have to manage those things. And, you know, we're just not, um, because of books like Anatomy of an Epidemic and others, uh, the, the path of psych meds is one that is fraught with many side effects, which are not going to be a, a, a great path for most people to take most of the time. And so we want to try to just make peace with who it is that, that we are. Um, and the fact that maybe that lives in a, a slightly more sensitive, noisy world for some of us um, is just kind of the, it's the flip side of being a highly conscientious person who's likely to be very successful and very effective in a lot of other areas of your life compared to somebody who's less conscientious. Great, thank you. Linda says, is jealousy a reflection of low self-esteem? Mm. Um, jealousy is more likely to be, uh, this is actually addressed in a lot of detail by David Buss, who is an evolutionary psychologist who wrote a book called The Evolution of Desire. Um, and he, he discusses jealousy at, at some length. And it's really, it's again, it's a mechanical process where you are, uh, you're feeling anxiety, rightfully so, about um, somebody taking something that is valuable to you away. So you're not, um, you know, there are personalities who are going to feel jealous uh, at, at a lower threshold than other personalities, just like some people are going to feel anxious at a lower threshold than other personalities. So, um, you know, I, I will talk to people who get jealous if their boyfriend I admires an actress in a movie, you know, who is not posing any sort of direct threat to the relationship at all, um, but who is still disturbing. They're, they're, they feel disturbed by the fact that he would have sexual interest in any other female at all. And then I, I have other clients and uh, no other people people who it would it would take you know 
your husband would have to come home and, and say that he'd had an affair to sort of get that reaction out of you. And even some people who wouldn't be bothered by that. So again, this is like a bell curve. It's a bell curve of behavior, um, but it's a dynamic bell curve that has to do with the value of your mate. So even somebody who is very sensitive to jealousy cues and is gonna feel really threatened if their mate is um, looks like they might be cheating or might be interested in defecting on them, they are going to be more likely to squawk about that if they have if that's a if they're really over rewarded by that mate and they feel like it's somebody that they could lose at any time rather than if they're what we call under rewarded and they're they're sort of like oh yeah you know i i know that i could do better out there on the open market but i've settled for this person so i can feel more secure in the relationship so it's a dynamic process that has everything to do with your position of power in the relationship um, and your personality characteristics and just kind of how prone you are to jealous thinking as well. Nice, thank you. So uh, Judy says, could you please ask Dr. Hawk if the internal audience is as neutral as she makes it sound? In my experience, my internal audience is oriented to look for what's wrong and to search for evidence about any negative beliefs I have about myself. How can I get back to it being more neutral? Yeah, I, I, uh, if I've ever characterized the internal audience as neutral, that was that was something I didn't intend to do because I don't think of it as neutral. I think of it um, sometimes. I will refer to the internal audience instead of as an audience. I actually call them a, a, a an auditing committee. They are looking for mistakes. They are. It's trying to help you. It's it's trying to improve your your performance is trying to improve your standing. Uh, the internal audience is, is built into your brain to watch your behavior and make recommendations, sometimes not in the most friendly way, um, through your moods and your thoughts to improve your performance so you get better feedback from the outside world. That's why it exists. That's why it's watching your rehearsal process. It's like a little, it's a, it's a combination of a focus group and an auditing committee. Um, so they are, they're paying attention and they're, they're paying critical attention to what it is that you're doing and what mistakes you might be making. It's much more attuned to um, giving you a hard time about the mistakes it perceives you making than giving you um, good feelings and rewards for doing a good job. It can give you good feelings and, and reward uh, for doing a good job, but it's a very subtle process. The internal audience is not going to throw you a parade. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to feel, you're not going to get this, this incredibly proud of yourself feeling for anything more than maybe a, a quick moment after you've accomplished something. It's much more sort of a, a stable sense of pride and accomplishment that the internal audience will reluctantly give you um, if you've been really consistent and you've been really diligent in doing something that has been difficult for you, but that is meaningful to improve your competitive position in the world. That that's what gets the gold stars from the internal audience. But it's not it's not very loud and it's not very um, it's it's you might not even notice it if you're not very attuned to it. And it's really the internal audience is always a amalgam of your own personality characteristics. So if you've got a self-critical, highly conscientious personality, your internal audience is going to have a higher bar for what it's gonna be impressed by, just like you have a higher bar for other people. Um, and so that that might mean that you have to be a little more diligent and a little more on task to get that grudging gold star eventually. You know, I'll never forget when Dr. Lyle said that Dr. Alan Goldhammer has an internal audience that constantly gives him standing ovations for doing absolutely nothing. Just walking into the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's true for some people. You know, some people will have, they will have that feeling of pride and they will get. Oh, she's. There you go. You, oh, froze, I come froze, you just froze for a second. You said some people have that feeling of pride. Yeah, some people will get that for with very little effort. You know, they just they they manage to uh, you know use uh, they they use half a teaspoon of sugar in their coffee instead of a tablespoon this morning, and that's like oh you know I get a, I did a great job, and so it really is uh, very sensitive to who who you are and what kind of personality you have. That's what it all. Is. It, you know, pride's so interesting because you know I could probably get away with dietary indiscretions, but even if it wouldn't affect my weight, it, it, I, I feel like it affects like how proud I feel about myself. And that's one of the reasons I don't do it is because I feel better when I, when I just stay the course. Yeah. Like of course. And, and particularly when you've been, um, you know, you've really accumulated a lot of time with compliance and it's sort of like that, that has become something like that. The length of time is also something that you're very proud of. So I think this is very important for people who are in a recovery process. So for me with alcohol, I, I 
like I hit, I hit some real roadblocks in my life around the, the eighth or ninth month of my sobriety. And I really believe that it was like, I had, I had just enough time um, that if, if those roadblocks had happened when I only had three or four months, I would have been much more likely to relapse, but I had just enough time and I was just close enough to one year. And and I really wanted to make it to a year because I had made it just far enough that the, the sort of sunk cost of that and the feeling that I didn't want somebody, I didn't want to take that away from myself and I didn't want to give up all of that hard work. Um, that had some real special sauce to it. Um, no pun intended with an alcoholic story, but I, so I, it was that, that was really, really important. And then the more time that I get, you know, it's seven years now and it's like, that is something to be freaking proud of. And I'm not going to give that up to, to have a drink, even if I could get away with it or, um, you know, people might not know or it wouldn't affect me that much. So these things have important feedback loops. You know, it's interesting because Dr. Michael Clapper often says in terms of just health and physiology that our body is never not looking, but I almost feel like our internal audience is never not looking. So even if we can get away with it, we really can't get away with it. Totally, totally. I, it, it really, I, the internal audience knows if you've been bad or good. It knows if you've been, you know, it, it knows when you're sleeping, it knows when you're awake. So it's you, you do not get any time off from that. We can try to bargain with it and, you know, ask for time off and say, hey, I deserve this. And I've been through a really tough time. And you can sometimes snowball the internal audience into seeming like you're getting a pass, but it will catch up with you eventually. The, the internal audience will get the memo and realize that you bluffed it. And that's a, that's a bad feeling. It almost sometimes feels like the internal audience is almost like a, your conscience in a way. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, I think it, it many different traditions and uh, different ways of talking about this, we'll, we'll call it by that name for sure. Cool. Well, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't have at least one question about a cookie from Catherine. I am great eating SOS free meals, which I thoroughly enjoy, and I don't feel deprived, but I want a treat, such as vegan cookies or crackers after my last meal, which is usually around 4 p.m. Not huge amounts. Do you have any suggestions on how to move on and put down the treats? I would say don't buy the treats. Yeah, don't definitely don't buy the treats because as, as long as they're in the house, they're in your mouth, as AJ says. Um, and the other piece of that is you're likely in some version of what we call a conditioned cram. So uh, you can go back and watch, um, you know, Dr. Lyle has talked a lot about this. I've talked about it a little bit, but the general idea is that, of course, you know, we are wired to eat the the richest food in the environment that we can get our little paws on at any given time. Um, and if we have been regularly indulging in fairly rich food, even, even technically compliant, plant-based, but it's, it's sort of on the richer side of things. Um, so uh, the most common, common source of a cram circuit that we see is something like Ezekiel bread with almond butter. People will get into that or, or cereal with soy milk or something like that. So these are things that are quite calorie dense compared to, you know, really where we want to be with a general diet of a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and if people get into that on a regular basis and it doesn't take too long to go up the learning curve, you develop a little association um, where essentially you, a certain time of day um, and even having a full stomach of really healthy food can itself become the trigger for this craving, this feeling that I just need a little something. I just need a little something after a, a really good day. Uh, and it's just a conditioned process. It's a conditioned process, just like if I pick the keys up off the table, the dog's going to get really excited because he's going to think that we're about to go somewhere. He has formed that noise. He's actually really sensitized to the Instant Pot now because that's where the sweet potatoes come from. Um, and he's a sweet potato fiend. So when he hears the Instant Pot beep, he gets very excited about it and he goes into the kitchen and he stares at it and he waits for a little bite of sweet potato. Um, in fact, I'm surprised he's not coming over here when I'm saying sweet potato to look for some. So that's what you've done with the, the vegan cookies and everything else is you, the, the clock strikes a certain hour and the sun's at a certain point in the horizon and you have a full belly full of compliant, healthy food. And there's just this little feeling that I just need something and it's just association. And you can break free of that um, by white knuckling your way out of it. It's not gonna be comfortable for the first couple of days. It's gonna suck. You're gonna have, the cravings are gonna go up before they go down, um, just like with any withdrawal process from any super normal stimuli. But if you can hang on and strap yourself in for four or five days, um, that, that craving will go away. A craving is just a compensatory 
uh, response from the nervous system anticipating what you're about to give it, which you've been giving it under those same conditions for some amount of time. So my craving for coffee in the morning, because I remain a, a stubborn coffee addict, is because the, the, the compensatory response is that because I've been having the stimulant every morning, um, my, I, I actually, my, my energy is, is depressed anticipating the stimulant is going to jack it up. Um, alcohol does the opposite. So that's why people have the tremors when they quit alcohol. So at the lower level of a supernormal food, the little compensatory response that you have to anticipate the treat is that you're going to salivate a little, your digestive enzymes are going to churn up a little, you're, you're going to feel like, yeah, I want something sweet. You want the specific little thing. Um, and you've just trained yourself to expect it. So you just have to go through the discomfort of letting it go. Just so you know, I don't know if you can see the comments, but I want to read a few of you. Lisa says, we could watch her all day. I and uh, Nadej says, I love Dr. Hawk. She's brilliant and easy to understand. And uh, Amy says, love Jen Hawk. This is my first time seeing her. Well, then you'll have to come back Sunday because it just happened that she was already booked. Because I, I do ask Dr. Lyle and Dr. Hawk either to come on separately or together once a month. And so far they've said yes. So she was already booked Sunday when we got this bonus one. So there is this sort of long question on trauma, which I know you are, it's your specialty. I'll save that for Sunday oh, okay. uh, because you'll have, you'll, I think you'll be able to run with this and maybe even spend the whole hour talking about yeah, it. Long, but, right. Topic. So we'll start on that. But I think you'll have time for just one more question from Sue. I don't have a clean environment due to other family members items, but most times I can manage it well. I hide their stuff away and have lots of prepped compliant food on hand front and center so I can get to it easily. But there are times when something upsetting suddenly happens. And at that moment, I will still grab junk no matter what I have, whatever, no matter what healthy options are in reach. I'll try to talk myself out of it by saying people who love themselves don't hurt themselves with junk food, but the voice in my head where, where the compulsion is coming from won't be quiet. I wonder in these moments, am I consciously trying to harm myself and why would I do that? Because it's in the environment. Yeah, it's in the environment. You, it's it's a ticking time bomb if it's in the environment. It's waiting for exactly this kind of circumstance where you, you get out of what we call your deep groove. So the, the, your best friend with living healthfully is living in a deep groove where you're basically eating the same things every day. Your schedule is more or less the same. Your body and your mind can prepare and anticipate how to allocate your time and energy in accordance with what your day is going to look like. And so it gets very, it's all just very mechanical and you don't have to expend a lot of willpower to make a different decision because you've, it's already decided for you. You're already just in the groove. We take you out of the groove with, with a bad thing or a good thing. You know, we take you to a restaurant for a celebration with some friends, or we give you a really shitty day at work or a fight with your spouse or anything like that. Anything that disturbs the groove, you become, um, um, a, a animal who is trying to do the next best, most effective, most efficient um, thing with your precious time and energy. And that is going to be the way that we know what the next best, most effective thing with our time and energy is, is that it gives us dopamine. That is really like, that is nature's gift to us to let us know that we're doing the right thing. Um, that's why that's why it's built in. So you'll get dopamine by eating carrot sticks or by having a kale salad um, uh, or by going for a nice walk on the beach or any anything any natural non supernormal stimuli gives you the feeling that you're doing the right thing you're doing something really productive for your survival and reproduction um, but if you're in an environment where you've got supernormal food around and you're, you suddenly become a dopamine seeking machine more than usual because you've been taken out of your groove you're just trying to solve the survival problem you're just trying to do the most effective thing and so of course you're going to gravitate to the most supernormal food that you know that is stashed away in your husband's cabinet behind the behind the cans of unsalted beans there's some oreos back there and you're going to get into them because you know that they're there and they're just waiting for your defenses to be down we we t sometimes compare this to like the barbarians are at the gate with their battering ram trying to you know get into the city um and you can hold them off but at some point you have to sleep at some point you have to you're going to leave and you're going to go check on the kids you're going to do something and they're going to get in um so you just don't you can't have the supernormal food sitting around or it is a matter of time before you get into it unless you've got like the, the ridiculous levels of conscientiousness um, and enough motivation but that's that's going to be very rare don't make something that is the hardest thing that you can do in the modern environment fighting every strongest instinct that you have that you've developed over thousands of generations don't make it even harder for yourself by having supernormal food around 
I couldn't agree with you more because if you have non-compliant food in your environment, it's not a question of if you will eat it. It's just a question of when. Of course. I mean, it's in, it's, I, everybody I know has been in the situation where no matter how motivated you are, no matter how on track you are, um, you know, I, I've heard some hilarious stories from clients of the stuff that they suddenly remember is in the pantry or in the depths of the freezer um, and the, the lengths that people will go to, to to find the most super normal substance that they can find. And you can, you can observe this behavior even when you have compliant food around, when you're stressed, you're still going to want the highest calorie dense food. You're, 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 it's, it may not be junk, but you're going to go for oatmeal before you go for carrot sticks. You're going to go for mango before you go for romaine. You're just, it's, you are, you're this like heat seeking calorie density machine. Um, ever since I saw the study with the chimps where the chimps, you know, you offer chimps bananas and they're really happy about bananas. They're like, yay, we love bananas. We're chimps. This is great. And then you offer them cooked bananas, which are 10% more calorie dense or whatever specific, I, I forget how exactly more calorie dense they are, but it's just more bioavailability, um, more bang for the buck. They are way more excited about the cooked bananas than they are about the raw bananas. So um, animals perceive this naturally. We do exactly the same thing. Um, don't make life harder for yourself than it already is. You know, it seems that all the people that teach this stuff, like you and me and all the other doctors, we know this. I, yesterday, Dr. Frank Sabatino had a similar question in our private group, and he said, "Welcome to the world of dopamine." You know, but the people that are experiencing it. I don't know why they don't take Dr. Lyle's advice, which is to work harder on your environment than you do your, yourself. I don't know how people live with non-compliant food because I'm in a period right now where there is some and it, it ha there hasn't been anything over mm. a calorie density of 600 calories per pound, which is beans in my environment for eight and a half years. Oh, wow. What happened is Charles, um, Charles lost some weight during the pandemic. And he's already really, really thin because the gym is closed. So he's not exercising. Yeah. And so we went to our lifestyle medicine doctor and, and he is technically underweight now. And so the, the doctor, we have a wonderful plant-based doctor at Loma Linda, Dr. Wayne Dyson, where he says, you know, I don't worry about people underweight if they have good nutrition, but if you want to put on some weight, this is what you do. So guess what's in the house now temporarily? Ezekiel cinnamon raisin bread and uh -huh. cashew butter. And, oh my and God. I'm not going to do it because you know me, I'm very, I'm just, I'm not. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, is if me, Chef AJ is being driven crazy by that, how do those regular people that haven't achieved their health and weight loss goals live 365 days? And, th and by the way, this is, I wouldn't even call it non-compliant food. It's just very, very calorically rich. And it's funny because when the, you know, we do everything, you know, you hide it. I, but the thing is, I know it's there. You know, so it's all I think about is, oh my God. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, and, and, and when he toasts it, it's even worse because now I'm smelling it. And oh, it makes it even more calorie dense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny because the individual components don't bother me so much. Just looking at a jar of nut butter or looking at bread. But then when he makes the sandwich with the jam and it's toasted, it's like my, I just like, I don't know how long it's going to go on with me being able to live like this. So what I'm trying to say is if I can't do it, if Dr. Goldhammer's wife can't have that stuff in the house, what makes think you guys think you can work yeah. harder on your environment than you do yourself? As Dr. Lau says, number one rule for healthy living, no junk food in the house. It's really, and, and this is the, this is the trap people get into where it's like, well, Ezekiel bread and cashew butter, that's not junk food. Those are healthy foods, but, but they may be even individually. I mean, that's an important principle, but when you put them together, I had a really interesting experience where I found myself in a cram circuit with, um, oatmeal with blueberries and flax. So very virtuous food, but I discovered as soon as I took either the blueberries or the flax away, I was much less interested in the cram circuit with that food. I, I certainly didn't want a plain bowl of oatmeal in my cram circuit. So it's, you never know what the tipping point is for the calories per bite that when you're, when you're adding those combinations of those flavors and textures and calories, um, that certainly you're, you're going to tip yourself over. And I, yeah, I don't know anybody that could hold it together in the face of toasted cinnamon bread and oh cashew. I mean, God. No, it's ridiculous. And yes, we people are asking, do we have a lockbox? Yes, but the point I'm trying to make is I'm not going to eat it, but the amount of bandwidth it's taking to have to think about it all day, it's just not worth it. 
it's it's and this is this is well documented effect this is why you've got mark zuckerberg wearing the same uniform all the time is because he can't he can't afford to waste precious cognitive bandwidth on deciding what to wear every day so he just wears a uniform so when you're when you're fighting that you you know it's there you know it's there you know it's there you're trying you don't want to get into it you're depleting your willpower store basically which is a finite resource that you have that you wake up with every day and then you know something else comes at you from left field Field where you're you're out and about and somebody offers you some other supernormal food, your defenses are way, way, way down because you've been fighting the cinnamon toast and the cashew butter all day. Um, so you're much more susceptible to that because it's your your you're worn down essentially. So these are all things that we need to guard against. Yeah, it might be in a lockbox and you can't get to it, but it's still it's still having an effect on you and your ability to solve this problem. Absolutely. Well, thank you. It's just been so great talking to you. I really appreciate it. Please tell Dr. Gregor we so appreciated him as well. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday when you're going to talk about emotional eating and trauma, because that is really what the question is about. So I look forward Sounds to it. Good. All right. Thank we'll you as well. So thank you so great. much, Dr. Hawk. And thank the rest of you guys for watching this bonus episode. Please come back tomorrow at the regular time, 11 a.m. Pacific time, when I'll be talking to Dr. Betty. She used to weigh over 200 pounds, was a smoker eating junk food. And now at the age of 79 and a half, runs ultra marathons and is a whole food plant-based eater. So if you please, we have inspirational people coming up every day this week. Thanks again, Dr. Hawk. Take care. Yeah, you too. Have a good night.